so it's great to be here. Um, this is the first lecture I've given in 15 years. Uh, so I'm a little rusty and a little nervous. Um, <laughs> Um, but, uh, you know, I have to hand it to Neil with his persistence to get me out here. Um, you know, I'm working on a new book, so I wanted to run the ideas past an intelligent and sympathetic audience, so I, th this, I thought this would be a perfect group. Um, and, you know, it, it's a bit of a leap from what people have been talking about today in terms of the uh, clinical work. Um, I did the clinical research back in the 90s, um, and in terms of the, oops, uh, okay, you can hear me. Um, yeah, so in the spirit molecule, I more talked about the molecule than the spirit, and uh, in the book I'm working on now, I want to be talking more about the spirit than the molecule. Um, so it isn't really clinically based or pharmacologically based, it's more conjectural, uh, more some spiritual musings about establishing an alternative model for some of the spiritual aspects of the psychedelic experience. Uh, so in uh, terms of an overview, I thought I'd review the DMT research that we did at the University of New Mexico, then walk through the process of deciding to study ancient Hebrew phenomenon of prophecy as an alternative model of both understanding and integrating and applying the psychedelic experience, especially the more uh, unusual spiritual elements of the psychedelic experience. Um, I'll give a little background into scripture and this concept of prophecy. Uh, I'll, talk about the, I'll talk about the prophetic message, which is the content or the information in the prophetic state, and then uh, we'll suggest some implications of the model. Can everybody hear me all right? Yeah, okay, good. Okay, uh, so first I'd like to, uh, you know, extend my appreciation to all of those people at UNM that made this research possible. Um, it was th uh, the first such study in the U.S. in quite a long time, so it took a lot of organizing and getting people to help out each other. Uh, so uh, the people at the University of New Mexico were great. Um, I received the majority of my funding from the National Institutes of Health. Uh, especially from the National Institute on Drug Abuse, um, FDA, DEA. Uh, I, uh, the first grant I got was from the Scottish Rite Foundation. Uh, okay, there we go. Uh, so Dave Nichols at Purdue University made the DMT, and of course all of the volunteers, their families and friends. Okay, uh, so there's a couple of take-home messages and a couple of definitions. Let's start with the definition. Um, uh, so most people think of uh, most people think of prophecy um, as predicting the future, but I'm going to be defining it more generally as the paradigmatic spiritual experience as described in the Hebrew Bible, or uh, um, uh, more uh, more the Old Testament, um, and I'll also, and uh, and in, th in that context, then I'll be. Uh, describing it, or I'll be defining it as the perception of spiritual or invisible worlds as opposed to, uh, as opposed to predicting the future. You know, sometimes predicting the future occurs within a prophetic state, but it isn't necessary for the definition. Uh, so with respect to uh, some of the more controversial uh, conclusions that I've been kind of mulling over, uh, are, well, those are two in nature. One of which is on that the core of the prophetic experience as described in the Bible is a psychedelic state. And um, the other is that the full flowering or, yeah, okay. Uh, so, uh, so the full flowering of the psychedelic experience for the Western mind is prophecy. Uh, so in terms of my interest in this field, as an undergraduate, I became fascinated with uh, the relationship um, well, I started to think about the relationship between uh, spiritual states which came about through the ingestion of psychedelic drugs um, and the descriptions of spiritual states which, which came about um, through other means such as meditation, some near-death states, those kinds of experiences. So it uh, seemed to me that there must be some common biological denominator 
uh, either a particular part of the brain that was being activated and or um, it's, you know, some kind of, uh, 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 um, or else, you know, some kind of, you know, psychoactive compound. Um, I started off with an interest in the pineal gland because of its being the focus of attention of a number of esoteric, uh, uh, you know, physiological systems. Um, all of the precursors and enzymes required to make psychedelic tryptamines occur in the pineal. B um, b uh, b but despite that, uh, we still um, uh, we still don't really have any evidence that the pineal gland makes DMT. And we still don't really know even if DMT levels increase during dreams or near death states. You know, I um, speak about a lot of circumstantial evidence in the DMT book, but um, we still, um, uh, but we still don't have that data. Um, but I was still interested in, well, uh, so this was the early 1980s and we didn't really know that much about melatonin. Um, so I uh, spent about three years working on a melatonin study. Uh, uh, and this was the first paper that came out. And uh, uh, well, so basically um, we determined that melatonin was not psychedelic. <laughs> Um, and so I switched focus. Um, I thought, well, you know, if the pineal gland isn't involved or if specifically melatonin isn't involved, then let's just go straight to the heart of the matter and study DMT. So um, let's see, DMT is it's a chemical cousin of serotonin. So it's also closely related to melatonin. Um, it is made in the body, in other words, it's endogenous. And uh, the location of, of, you know, most of the DMT synthesis out there uh, is made in the lungs, also in the red blood cells. Um, it's quite common in the plant kingdom, as we all know, and it's the visionary ingredient in ayahuasca. So it took two years to get approval to get this uh, study up and running. Uh, um, there were safety concerns, and I had anticipated those. Uh, a few years before I had reviewed all of the adverse effect literature on psychedelics and published a review paper and uh, established that if you give uh, you know, psychedelics to carefully screen people in a carefully supervised uh, uh, you know, circumstance and you follow them up appropriately, um, you know, then the incidence, of ad uh, uh, well, the incidence of any kind of adverse effect would be quite low. Um, also, there is a bureaucratic jungle that I had to kind of hack my way through with an um, administrative and a, a you know, paperwork machete. Um, and so this is a, a description of the process about how we got approval. I like to joke about this paper as the what if I'm hit by a bus you know, paper uh, you know, before anybody else can get any kind of research off the ground. So uh, I was thinking it was important you know, to describe sort of step by step, the FDA process, the DEA process, the local pharmacy process, all those things. Um, so we approached the study from a psychopharmacological model, uh, it, and you know, more specifically, it was a dose response model. Um, so we gave small doses, medium doses, and large doses to a group of experienced hallucinogen users who were otherwise healthy or, you know, especially healthy, as it were. Um, yeah, um, so we gave quite a few doses to about 60 volunteers, around 400 doses total spread out over the space of, of about five years. Um, the endpoints that we were interested in looking at were serotonin related, um, all kinds of biological effects. Um, in, in terms of the subjective effects, um, so we gathered those with a clinical interview just speaking to the volunteers after they came down. Um, and also I developed, a, uh, I developed a, you know, paper and pencil rating scale, which was based on Buddhist, um, you know, psychological principles. So that is a paper that I wrote as a medical student actually, uh, um, came out in uh, 1980. You know, it's interesting, uh, uh, the typo, you know, medication as opposed to meditation, but, uh, you know, this was 1980, so even meditation was, you know, wasn't that much on the radar, you know, uh, within the context of psychiatry. 
Um, so in terms of how we supervised the sessions, it was kind of a combination of a psychoanalytic approach and a Zen Buddhist, you know, just quietly sitting approach. You know, so the bottom line was that we just, you know, sat quietly and were quite attentive to everything that was going on in the volunteer and in the room. Uh, so this is an article that came out in, uh, in the journal Tricycle in, uh, a few years back, uh, uh, which discussed the relationship between Buddhism and, uh, and uh, um, and psychedelics. And it, you know, specifically, you know, focused on the, on uh, the interaction of, uh, you know, supervising sessions. Um, so we got a, quite a few biological results, quite a few subjective, you know, data results. Um, all of the serotonin-related endpoints that we were anticipating uh, um, would increase, increased. Uh, this is the first paper describing all the endocrine and autonomic uh, uh, responses um, to graded doses of DMT. Um, this came out in 1994, even though we finished the study at the end of 1991. And uh, these are the psychological results. Um, uh, and also an interesting uh, study that we did is to give people uh, a number of doses of DMT closely spaced over the course of a morning. Uh, we gave a you know, fairly substantial dose every half hour four times to you know, determine if we could develop tolerance uh, to the psychological effects and, and uh, um, there wasn't any tolerance you know, to the psychological response anyway, uh, you know, dose after dose. Okay, um, so th uh, the state of mind that people entered into on the high dose of DMT, um, well, it, uh, it's hard to describe, but you know, a lot of people have tried describing it. Um, it kind of starts off with a separation of mind and body, and then the consciousness of that person, it beholds an environment composed of light in which they frequently interacted with clearly seen, sentient, over, often overwhelmingly powerful beings. Um, one of the very common descriptions was, the, uh, was that the experience um, was more real than real. Um, it was also strangely familiar after the initial shock was over, an interesting you know, kind of quality to the effect. Um, Classical near death and uh, the Buddhist enlightenment sort of experiences, which I expected would be relatively common, were actually quite rare. Um, just perhaps, you know, two people or three at the most. Um, and so it was hard to get a grip on these stories, especially, you know, because they were counter to my expectations. I was expecting a, a, a you know, unitive kind of mystical kind of white light experience. Um, or going through the tunnel, seeing ancestors, and then ending up, you know, merging with some kind of godhead figure. Uh, but instead, it was quite interactive, dynamic. The ego was maintained. Uh, observational powers were maintained. Um, you know, so I went back to the drawing board after the study wrapped up in 1995. Um, so there's a couple of approaches to this is your brain on drugs model of DMT. Uh, so, um, so one of them is what I guess would be called the neurotheology model, which is gaining some traction. And um, so, that, uh, so that proposes that the brain generates these phenomena. Um, the other might be what you could call a um, kind of theoneurology approach, you know, more bottom down. Uh, well, um, I mean more top up. I mean more top down. Um, in, in, in other words, um, as a result of the brain changes that occur with DMT, the receiving characteristics of the brain change, and it's now able to perceive things that are external but are, are invisible uh, you know, most of the time. Um, and you can think about you know, where that could reside, dark matter, parallel universes, multiverses, those kinds of things. Uh, so you know, one of the advantages of, of, of you know, the top-down model is it could be possible one day to photograph people's DMT experiences if you know they're uh, if they're occurring out there, um, you know some combination of brain scan technology and you know contemporary uh, you know quantum physics uh, you know, um, kinds of machines, um, which would be a very interesting uh, you know time when that happens. 
Um, in either case, you know, the scientific models focus primarily on the mechanisms of action as opposed to understanding the experience as personal or, uh, you know, um, or, um, or cultural meanings and their applicability and integration. Uh, you know, the other models uh, which describe the nature of, of invisible worlds are the spiritual models. Um, and also the spiritual models address more directly the meaning and the integration of uh, um, of these experiences. Um, are you guys with me so far, pretty much? Yeah, okay, good. Might sound simple. <laughs> yeah, it's taken me a long time to get this wrapped down, I'll tell you. It's, uh, you know, it's a stretch you know, to extend myself beyond all the brain chemistry and, you know, pharmacology stuff. And uh, I have no training in theology or philosophy or Bible studies or anything. I just, uh, you know, stopped being a Buddhist after my community gave me the boot when I was talking about DMT and Buddhist practice. So uh, I thought, uh, I'll just read the Bible. That's where I used to hang out. So. Um, <laughs> After a while, the concept of Old Testament uh, uh, you know, prophecy, uh, you know, b began, you know, um, uh, um, to present itself, and uh, it seemed like a rich, you know, vein to start to mine. Uh, okay, um, so in uh, terms of candidate spiritual systems or you know religions, uh, um, so they also are concerned with the nature of spiritual or, or, um, the, or the invisible worlds and also how to apply that information uh, within the individual and between people. Um, so this is a quote or, you know, kind of a paraphrase of Spinoza's distinction between superstition and um, a more um, adult, you know, kind of uh, true religion. You know, one of them is uh, the result of, um, you know, in in, in intellectual and, and uh, you know meditative inquiry and and uh, the other you know kind of uh, mostly plays on uh, on uh, people's hopes and fears you know so uh, Spinoza often described things in kind of a tongue-in-cheek manner but uh, I think his distinction between superstition which a lot of you know people kind of uh, you know hoist up as the straw man to battle against with when it comes to the, you know, the war between, uh, uh, you know, science and religion. Um, I, I don't think, you know, they're actually speaking about what Spinoza would refer to as a true religion. You know, um, well, uh, so the two contemporary spiritual models which have been used in uh, understanding the um, the, uh, the psychedelic experience are uh, the Buddhist model um, and, uh, in, and increasingly so over the last, you know, 10 years or so is, you know, the Latin American uh, 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 shamanic model. Um, so, um, so Buddhism and, uh, the, and uh, the psychedelic, you know, drugs um, appeared almost at the same time on the Western, uh, you know, scene in uh, the late 50s, early 60s. Um, and it's clearly relevant in, um, if, if you look at how many people entered on um, the path of Buddhist meditation as a result of their psychedelic experiences. And, you know, that continues to be the case. Um, in our study, though, the DMT response wasn't really typical of the Buddhist enlightenment experience as I had studied it and, you know, learned it uh, within, uh, um, within the Zen community. Uh, and it actually, you know, could be the case that other compounds which are made endogenously are, you know, more typically um, involved in those kinds of unitive experiences, you know, such as, five, you know, such as, you know, 5-methoxy DMT, um, which more typically, you know, gives you a, an experience of the white light. Um, also, another shortcoming of the Buddhist model is um, is a, is a, their conviction. Uh, th that these experiences are the perceptions of uh, uh, um, of the mind, as opposed to uh, uh, um, as opposed to being perceptions of the external world or an external reality. 
um, which is freestanding and, 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 and uh, independent of the mind. And also another drawback is that most of us aren't Eastern, um, you know, so it's a whole different, you know, mindset and culture and, and you know, psychology. Um, so the other model, which is increasingly uh, you know, popular in terms of understanding and applying the psychedelic state, is that of Latin American shamanism. Um, its uh, strengths are th on that it does account for the freestanding nature of the other worlds. Um, it emphasizes spirits, though, rather than God most of the time, which you know, for many uh, you know, Westerners could be a problem. Um, also, in the case of Buddhism as well, we don't really, you know, come from that culture. And also, there's quite a few ethical and, you know, moral shortcomings within shamanism, uh, which everybody knows about. Or, you know, contemporary shamanism, anyway. Um, I have a joke, Terence used to talk about shamans, but I won't share it. It's a bit off color. <laughs> Okay, well, no, I won't. Uh, um, afterwards, I will. Um, or, you know, uh, I'm like, once I'm down on the floor. Um, okay, well, you know, so um, as an alternative, I started looking into the Bible and, you know, Judaism. Uh, so what is the Bible? Um, well, it's, uh, tw it's uh, 24 books in Hebrew. Uh, well, there's a uh, small amount of Aramaic, you know, but the vast majority it, um, has been written in Hebrew. Um, it's composed of three main parts. Um, the first part is the Torah, which you know contains uh, um, uh, it, 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 it contains the books of Exodus and of Genesis, Leviticus, those books. Uh, the, and the next section is called the Prophets, which um, you know contains the books of Ezekiel, Jeremiah, and Isaiah. And, and also, um, well, uh, so the final section is called the writings, and it contains the Psalms and the wisdom literature, such as Job and Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. Um, it, uh, so the compilation of the Bible was finalized in around the second century CE. Uh, um, so a extremely curious element of, uh, uh, of the Bible is, is uh, that the Hebrew, um, isn't punctuated, or uh, um, um, and it isn't vowelized either. Uh, you know, so that uh, clearly opens the interpretation of the text to a huge amount of of you know variability. Uh, so, um, so the punctuation and the vowels weren't added until the 10th century. Uh, so the contents of the Bible, uh, obviously, is a huge book, and you know, it ex and its influence extends everywhere. Um, you know, some of the more you know salient uh, uh, you know concepts which it describes are uh, the nature and the activities of God. Uh, it also has a specific you know version of creation, um, and also it contains a huge amount of what is often called the law. But I think it's, um, it is, you know, more accurate to define that as ethical and, you know, moral instructions or, uh, um, or charges. In other words, a manifestation of the content of uh, the psychedelic or the prophetic experience as um, being applied and integrated uh, within a everyday, you know, kind of life experience. Um, in uh, other words, it's, you know, the manifestation of the content of the, of, uh, the prophetic state into a kind of practical form. Um, so, so there are, um, are certain, uh, um, uh, so there are um, certain advantages to looking at the Bible as a spiritual slash, uh, uh, you know, psychedelic text. Um, it uh, describes a highly dynamic interactional relationship between humans and external spiritual forces. And so that was quite consistent with the reports of our DMT volunteers. It's got an eth ethical framework built in. Um, it's uh, tr it's, um, it's uh, tremendously popular. Uh, it you know, serves as, th um, as uh, the original sacred text uh, for one half of the world's population, uh, the Muslims and the Christians and the Jews. Um, and its concepts and its vocabulary, its you know, concept of God, its concept of law, 
of wisdom, of you know, interpersonal relationships, um, all of those completely inter, you know, um, are infused in, in, into our culture and our minds and our literature and our science. Um, and it has tremendous power. I mean, look at this building. I mean, this building would not exist if it weren't for the Hebrew Bible. So, um, you know, one of the you know, complaints about the Bible is that it's been misused and terrible people have done terrible things with it. But on the other hand, our ignorance of it permits those you know, people um, who have less than scrupulous interpretations and applications of that power, you know, to kind of interpret it for us or, you know, for the larger community. Um, so there's a, a, so there are a number of, uh, um, of resistances to looking at the study of the Bible as a spiritual or, or you know, psychedelic text. One of those is uh, that familiarity breeds contempt. You know, but the vast majority of us, uh, 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 you know, um, have not, you know, become especially, you know, familiar with the Bible. Uh, I'm like, how many of you uh, um, have actually, you know, looked at the Bible in the last five or ten years? So about ten people. <laughs> you know, as as you know, as compared to reading Tricycle or Shaman's Drum or Enlightenment or those things, you know. Um, so that's you know, it's under our nose. But on the other hand, it just seems completely foreign. You know, some people think it's an evil book because of how it's been used, but, uh, you know, other people can use it, you know, people who've got a, a, a you know, psychedelic mindset. Um, a, a extremely common complaint is it makes no sense. Um, and I have to admit, when I first opened it up, it just made no sense. Um, or even as an adult opening it up, um, again, it made no sense. You know, but there are a small number of, you know, medieval Hebrew Jewish commentators on the Bible. Um, there's just a handful, and all of their commentaries have been translated into English. And I'll tell you, um, if you can start, you know, to read those commentaries, it'll explain what these confusing and, you know, contradictory ideas and stories um, actually mean, or um, at least, you know, uh, you know, can give you some tools to start to understand you know, some of the complexities of what's contained in there. Uh, um, also, a, another problem with the Bible is that it's right under our nose. It isn't exotic enough. But as we know, exotic religions become, you know, non-exotic, uh, you know, soon enough. Um, a, a, um, so one more, stumbling, you know, one more stumbling block to the Bible is the concept of God, you know, the G word somebody was, you know, describing it, you know, during intermission today. Um, and, you know, that was a problem for me, too. You know, the second word in the Bible is God. And, uh, you know, most people just say, well, I'm not interested. Um, and, you know, I felt that way for a long time as well. But I was able to, you know, kind of get a, a, a you know, kind of toll, a kind of toehold on the concept of God from the perspective of, you know, Zen Buddhism. In other words, I... Uh, um, I was able to understand the concept of God as the creator and sustainer of cause and effect or of karma. You know, so if I could at least at first kind of make myself comfortable with exploring the concept by straddling, you know, the Buddhist world and the Jewish world, it uh, um, allowed, in, you know, some entryway um, into that concept so I could start learning more. Um, and, you know, ultimately, you'll come to the point of, or, you know, I suppose one can come to the point of understanding God as the most subtle and abstract of all concepts, as opposed to the stupidest or most barbaric. So, um, and it's also the goal of all sciences, too. I mean, if you think about it, you know, biology, pharmacology, physics, you know, math, um, ultimately, what these people are interested in is, you know, the God particle or the God moment or the God you know, you know, the God gene or the God, you know, part of the brain. You know, so it's, uh, I think, unconsciously, that's what everybody is, you know, kind of searching for ultimately, especially with respect, you know, to theoretical science. Um, so there's two ways to know God. I'm going to be speaking about God, I'm sorry, but I've just got to. If you're going to be talking about Old Testament prophecy, you have to speak about God. So, you know, bear with me. You know, so there's, uh, um, so there's two ways to know um, about God if uh, you consider, you know, the medieval Jewish uh, uh, um, uh, uh, commentators. 
Um, so one is through the study of you know the natural world, uh, you know science, and uh, the other, and uh, the other is uh, through prophecy. Okay, um, uh, so it's the Hebrew Bible's version of spiritual experience, and it you know consists of beholding invisible things, um, and. If you define it in those kinds of terms, it extends beyond simply the classical prophets like Ezekiel and Jeremiah. Um, it extends to anyone in the Bible who's experiencing the perception of visible things. Um, and in a prophetic state, one beholds and communicates with God and angels. Um, you receive a message, and uh, then you're related to the community. Um, so it occurs within a prophetic state of consciousness. Um, it's, you know, it's uh, extremely visual, extremely auditory. There's the spoken word, all kinds of visions, extremely psychedelic visions. If you read the first chapter uh, um, of the book of Ezekiel, it's totally florid psychedelic stuff. Um, and uh, there's extremely powerful, and there's extremely powerful emotions, anxiety, fear, joy, strength, those kinds of things. Um, there's physical symptoms of agitation, internal pressure, uh, 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 you know, falling to the ground. Um, but at uh, the same time, and kind of like DMT, you know, once the initial shock is over, um, it, you know, kind of, uh, it, it, it almost takes on uh, the nature of ordinary discourse, you know, conversations, question and ask, you know, uh, um, uh, 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 questions and answers those kinds of things. Uh, so there's dissociation of the mind and body, there's flying through space. Um, and it's also interactive and it's relational. Also, it's um, an extremely you know, common hallmark is the description of, be of it being you know, more real than real. Uh, so there's no question at all in the mind of the person experiencing the state of prophecy that it is the perception of an external, ongoing, you know, parallel level of reality. You know, so in all of these ways, it comports, you know, fairly well uh, with the DMT effect. Um, okay, I, I, and, extra, and, you know, um, so there's the person of the prophet as well, uh, his constitution or, uh, um, or her constitution, uh, their training, uh, you know, their behavior, you know, in, uh, in terms of living an ethical and a moral life. Um, and, you know, finally, you know, there, you know, there could be the element of grace as well, but, you know, that's another discussion. Uh, you know, so the Hebrew Bible is a prophetic text. You know, that's one of the points um, I would like to make. It either records prophetic experience and or it's written, you know, by people in a prophetic state. Um, you, know, there's, you know, there's some interest about descriptions in the Bible of, you know, psychedelic plants. But uh, if you take into account the nature of naturally occurring, you know, psychedelic compounds which are um, which are made in the body, you can dispense, you know, with having to look, you know, for external agents, you know, to put individuals into a psychedelic state. I, 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 well, so one of the drawbacks, you know, of the model, especially with respect to DMT, is uh, is uh, the predominance of auditory, you know, kinds of occurrences in, uh, in uh, the prophetic state. Uh, the spoken word is very important. And the spoken word, even though it occurs here and there with DMT, isn't that common. Um, you know, so it uh, you know, could be that DMT is only one of you know, many you know, naturally uh, occurring, naturally you know, produced compounds in the, in, uh, the body responsible you know, for that state. You know, there could be other compounds uh, which have got a more predominant auditory effect. Okay, uh, so what's the content of the prophetic message? You know, this is obviously a, a huge question. You know, uh, uh, it's, uh, I, uh, let's see. Um, you know, uh, uh, so, so people have these experiences w w with drugs in, you know, the contemporary setting, but it's extremely difficult you know, to come back with a vocabulary and concepts which are applicable and which can be integrated into one's everyday life. Um, you know, um, so 
one of the um, advantages of you know considering the Bible as a place to get some orientation uh, for the psychedelic experience is uh, you know to look at you know their description of the content of the prophetic state. Um, okay. Uh, so uh, the golden rule is you know more or less the bottom line uh, of the prophetic message. Um, in other words, uh, um, it is to love your neighbor as yourself, for I am a God, or I am the Lord. Um, that's in Leviticus. And, you know, so, um, so, so there are uh, quite a few possible permutations. In other words, well, uh, for example, you should treat others as you would like to be treated. You should treat yourself as well as you treat others. You shouldn't treat yourself as you wouldn't want others to treat you. You shouldn't treat others as you wouldn't want to be treated. You know, so if you, you know, kind of begin with that as, uh, you know, the core of the prophetic message, um, then everything else kind of extends out from that. You know, the Ten Commandments, even such, you know, uh, everyday, you know, prosaic, uh, you know, uh, kinds of laws in the Bible, like if you dig a pit and your neighbor falls into it, it's your fault and you have to pay for his medical care. You know, all that stuff, you know, ultimately, uh, you know, kind of hinges on the golden rule. And, uh, you know, the message is, you know, it, uh, it uh, you know, comes, it, um, you know, comes, it, it, you know, comes from God, um, who is described as an ethical and a moral thing, you know, so, um, so the ethical and the moral content is kind of, you know, built in uh, to the source of, uh, of the prophetic message. Uh, so the, um, so the hoped, well, um, so the ultimate outcome of the application of the prophetic message is world peace. Um, it isn't um, actually uh, the equanimity of the individual. You know, so it's a completely reverse, you know, kind of approach as compared, you know, to the Buddhist one, let's say. You know, where, you know, um, uh, where one's in individual enlightenment comes first and, you know, then one'll and, uh, and after that, world peace follows. Um, you know, so there are, you know, some interesting novel insights that are contained in the Bible as well. You know, for example, in terms of science, you know, the whole concept of, of uh, creation from nothing. Um, also, they have a very interesting view of history as, you know, fulfilled prophecy. Um, they've got concepts like the end of days, the Messiah, uh, um, and, uh, you know, resurrection. Um, also, there's some interesting, you know, perspectives on human nature, such as Ecclesiastes and Job and Proverbs. Um, so also, there's the concept of, of, uh, of uh, the false prophet, you know, who they are and, you know, how to discern between true and, you know, false prophecy in ourselves and in other people. Um, you know, so it's interesting, you know, to, uh, you know, to consider the, uh, you know, the biological underpinnings of, uh, you know, the information as well, you know, the content of, uh, of uh, the prophetic message. Um, in other words, if the prophetic experience is latent within the mind-brain uh, you know, complex, you know, then so perhaps is uh, the prophetic message. Uh, so a couple of implications are, um, and, you know, so these kind of harken back, uh, you know, to some of the original take-home messages. Um, if the core of the prophetic experience is, you know, psychedelic in nature, um, then those who study the Hebrew Bible and are interested in entering the state of mind out of which the text emerged, um, it would be, you know, it would be worth considering the judicious use of, of you know, psychedelics. And, uh, and the other implication of, um, of another one of the overview, you know, points that I made, in other words, uh, that the full flowering of the psychedelic experience of the Western mind is prophecy is, uh, is, is that, you know, for contemporary psychedelicists who lack a cogent vocabulary or conceptual or ethical framework by which to understand and apply the psychedelic experience, it's worth considering the Hebrew Bible um, as a spiritual text. Okay, so that's mostly what I wanted to try and get across today. Thank you very much. Uh, th thank you.
You drew a distinction uh, from your uh, results of your DMT studies. Uh, you reported that DMT rarely uh, consummated in unit of mystical experience. Right. Do uh, you see a uh, draw a distinction between prophecy and mysticism? And uh, do you see the uh, Hebrew Bible as a mystical document as well as a prophetic document? Yeah. yeah. Um, oh, well, those are both good questions. Yeah, and I spent some time discussing them in my current book. I, I'm actually I, I'm going to be including an entire you know chapter on vocabulary and you know terminology in the book. But yeah, um, uh, um, I do think well. Um, so I do you know make a distinction you know between the prophetic experience and the mystical experience. Uh, you know the prophetic experience is interactive. Um, it's dynamic. Uh, you know, amigo um, integrity is maintained. There's questions, there's answers. And uh, the mystical experience is, you know, more the unitive, ego dissolving, you know, white light, you know, kind of experience. Um, and the question about do I, you know, consider the, uh, you know, the Bible as a mystical text? Um, you, well, that's, you know, kind of the Kabbalistic viewpoint. But I'm only going to be sticking, you know, to the Bible. I'm, you know, not going to be talking about Midrash or Talmud or Kabbalah in my book, you know, because it's just a vast literature and I just don't have the time or the skill or the energy, you know, to tackle it. So I'll just be taking on the Bible, which is just 24 books and, you know, the commentaries, you know, so, you know, so they also make a distinction, you know, between the mystical state and, uh, and uh, the prophetic state. You know, the mystical state, is you know kind of a late development in in you know Judaism, um, as opposed to the more you know kind of literal uh, understanding of the text. Your microphone. Thank you. Hi, I um, have asked had the opportunity. I, I've had the opportunity to ask two different shamans about their relationship to DMT, um, specifically when it's um, smoked. And one said, don't ever do it. It opens you up um, to adverse spirits that may or may not want to harm you. And the other one said, I love it, isn't it great? It's the best thing ever. And I'm just wondering where you stand um, on, on safety for the, the lay person. Uh, okay. I mean, are you asking if I think people should smoke DMT? <laughs> yes. And are you asking where to get some? <laughs> That's not the issue. <laughs> yeah, those are the two most common questions I'm faced with. Where, where can I get some and should I do it? Or vice versa. Uh, uh, well, you know, I don't encourage anybody, you know, to take drugs, you know, first of all. Uh, and, you know, second of all, there's a lot of people interested in taking drugs, increasing number of people interested in taking DMT. So I think you just ought to educate yourself and prepare yourself, get your intent together, you know, get yourself together as best as you can, um, you know, if you're going to be using it. Um, you know, I think, you know, somebody's saying it's the worst thing ever, don't do it. I mean, you have to kind of wonder about their motivations for giving, you know, that kind of answer. You know, um, are they interested in you paying them a bunch of money to drink ayahuasca down in Peru, you know, uh, or, you know, what exactly? So, um, you know, in our study, uh, you know, people did fine. I, I screened them carefully. We supervised their, you know, uh, we, you know, supervised their experiences very closely. You know, some people had, you know, um, some rough spots in their experiences, but, you know, there was nobody harmed, and almost everybody really was glad to have participated. You know, so, you know, so within the, uh, the context of our work, um, if you really mind your piece and cues, you know, the drug can be given safely. Other, other questions? Hello? Question. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned that there is an initial shock and that also um, there is an experience of peace later on. Um, do you also find that um, contact with God is associated with violence or uncontrolled rage sometimes? Uh, I couldn't quite hear all that question, I'm sorry. 
Um, could you repeat it and maybe speak a is, little bit is, uh, is contact with God based on the Hebrew uh, Bible associated with uh, violence or uncontrolled rage on, on the part of the perceiver? Um, in, well, uh, what do you mean in our volunteers? Or in general? On, on, on DMT or... Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I get your... Oh, well, you know, if you're asking, you know, if the concept of God as people are experiencing it is as a violent, angry God, you know, in... Well, you, well, you know, most of our DMT volunteers were not Jewish or Christian or, or you know, Muslim. You know, they were pagans or Buddhists or, you know, nature, you know, religious, you know, kind of adherents. Um, you, know, so, you know, so the ones that had an experience which, you know, they described later on as, you know, God-like, um, it was very beatific, very nurturing, very loving. You know, one of our volunteers in, in, encountered an, you know, an, an extremely angry, you know, you know, kind of warrior, you know, princess type. Um, you know, but that was, I'm um, actually the only person who encountered like a extremely, you know, fear, you know, uh, uh, I'm inducing, uh, you know, kind of spiritual entity. Okay, um, sir. So, <clears throat> oh, pardon my voice, I, I just remember that I'm losing it. <clears throat> so, you mentioned before that, um, um, people's experiences are realer than real, and um, and even even further to say that it might be possible to document uh, some of the experiences. I was wondering if you've ever tried to um, tried to do an experiment where you've made two people uh, experience DMT simultaneously, and if they've uh, were able to interact within uh, hyperspace, for lack of a better word. Well, no, we never did that, no. Well, that's reported in ayahuasca sessions as, you know, kind of group hallucinations, but we never gave DMT to two people at the same time. Uh, sir. Hi. I think part of what he was asking was, what kind of psychedelics give the kind of auditory hallucinations that we associate with God in the Bible? Because let's say this particular priorities in the morality described in the Bible that aren't necessarily what we associate with a lot of our psychedelic experiences. If not DMT, what kind of chemicals encourage auditory hallucinations with those kind of priorities, with yeah. hostility towards graven images and that kind of thing? Yeah. Um, well, so one candidate, you know, group of compounds are, you know, the anticholinergic drugs, like scopolamine and, you know, hyoscyamine and atropine, those kind of drugs. Um, and I was speaking with, you know, somebody this afternoon about Ibogaine, which often gives you a spoken voice, it seems to be the case. You know, um, and if those compounds exist in plants, you know, some kind of congeners or, you know, uh, closely related compounds must exist in the body as well. Uh, you know, we just haven't discovered them yet. Uh, miss. Just a second. Uh, um, there's a few universal human things like the pursuit of happiness and this pursuit of prosthetic states and spiritualities you were saying. Yeah, I'm getting excitable. Um, happiness can be considered intrinsic and a lot of people consider things that make you happy to have intrinsic just value in their own. And um, also the thing about, like, about auditory things, I thought DMT affected part of your language so wouldn't that make auditory things completely irrelevant, but um, serotonin is like usually equivocated with happiness and DMT is a very spiritual kind of thing. Do their similar structural components have to do with the intrinsic value of the two states? Um, I didn't catch the last part of that. Could you speak a little more slowly? Yeah, the fact that um, serotonin and DMT are so similar to each other, but that contribute to the intrinsic value of both the happiness state and the state of spirituality and the ability that you can't quite communicate them that they have like a weird value of their own, like with the, because they're cousins, does that have something to do with the two different like basic human things going on? Um, I might be having a seizure up here or something, but I just can't understand what you're, uh, you know, what you're asking. Uh, um, you know, could somebody translate or help me? Could, some, could somebody else ask that question? Um, I'm sorry? She wants to know the 
the chemical similarity of DMT and serotonin versus the uh, effect similarity? Is oh, oh, okay. Uh, that's a good question. Well, yeah. Um, well, in in terms of of uh, you know the pharmacology, you know DMT activates a you know number of different serotonin receptor subtypes. Um, so um, they're quite you know closely related from the point of view of you know functional pharmacology. You know, if you give an individual, uh, 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 well, if um, if you give an individual serotonin. Um, you know, it really um, it doesn't actually um, exert much in, in uh, terms of acute um, effects on mood. Well, you know, one of the interesting elements of our DMT results was that in, uh, is, is, is that um, it increased concentrations of a hormone called, which is called vasopressin, and um, that's quite close to oxytocin, which are, you know, the two uh, uh, you know, hormones which, you know, seem quite um, in, uh, which are quite important uh, for social bonding experiences. And so, um, so it, uh, you know, could be the case that, uh, you know, some of the, uh, um, some of the pro-social responses to ayahuasca and, you know, other psychedelic drugs could be, you know, related um, you know, to the release of, um, of those hormones. I think we have time for uh, one last question, and I actually promised this gentleman over here, if you'll excuse me. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Neil. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> it, seems, it seems to me that you're cherry-picking out of the Old Testament, so I'm curious how you, f how you reconcile or square an alliance with prophecy or a prophetic experience with a God who is wrathful, vengeful, jealous, and advocates genocide? Well, you know, uh, I'm sure I'm going to get asked that a lot. Uh, <laughs> uh, so here goes. Um, yeah, um, well, if you look at the Hebrew concept of God as acting through nature, too, you know, there's earthquakes, and there's death, and there's fires, and there's infectious diseases, and there's wars. And if you look at those things as ordained or controlled or kind of regulated by God, you can then, you know, kind of make the leap and, and you know, say God is wrathful or vengeful. Um, and also there's cause and effect, you know. Um, certain uh, things happen as a result of your actions. So. You know, the Canaanites are the ones who were, you know, ordered to be exterminated by, you know, the Hebrews when they entered Canaan. And, you know, um, I mean, God knows what the Canaanites were doing. You know, the, um, uh, you know, they could have been, you know, much worse, you know, than the Nazis. Or they could have been doing human sacrifice. Uh, well, that's what I'm saying. You know, who knows? So, uh, I think we have to put that on the back burner and just, you know, Let's call it a night. Thank you, yes. <laughs>